what advice do you have for folks getting into open source? You are an incredible open source contributor. You've done a lot. I think you've opened doors for many people. Um, what's what's your piece of advice there for folks to get into it, and why should they? Uh, I mean, the piece of advice is the the one you know that they always give to any anything in life is you know I was like, I don't remember the the exact phrasing, but it's like you know a, a journey of a, of a thousand miles starts with mm-hmm. starts with a small step, uh, a journey of thousands of GitHub stars start with one commit. <laughs> so do the freaking commit. Open your freaking laptop. Do the freaking commit. Uh, if you if you are new to this, maybe start with a project that you like. The biggest mistake with any ML system that I see in my life, which is try to build a recommender system where you don't have a full feedback loop in place to somehow evaluate how well you're doing and to capture those data uh, in a very principled way, right? So when I when I always talk to people that want to implement ML solution, I always say before putting this online, you need to think of the entire life cycle of your data which of course goes from data collection, data training, data pipeline, uh, how the model gets generated. But then super importantly, as importantly, every prediction the model does needs to be logged and needs to be joined together with whatever reaction your user do. There's a lot of things that makes for a great founder, but if you're good at spotting those, I feel as an investor, you're 10 times better than if you're just an investor that knows tech or I don't know, healthcare, but doesn't really understand people. So I know it's a it's a you know somewhat like a disappointing answer because there's no there's no recipe for solving this problem now, but that's what I really believe. I really if I was if I will ever become an investor in my life, maybe as a retirement occupation, <laughs> it may, may may suit may suit my retirement days. Um, that's what I want to index on. I want to index on great people mm-hmm. and then leave them build whatever whatever thinks is best because at the early stages even no re- no way to to understand if what they're doing makes any sense, right? Welcome to episode three of the AI Portfolio Podcast, the place to learn from experts and companies building great products with machine learning. Today, we have Jacopo Taliabue. I, I may have said that wrong, completely wrong. Uh, no, that's uh, actually nine out of ten. Nine that's, out of that's ten. very good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the most pragmatic open source contributors in the machine learning community, in my opinion. Um, he sold his e-commerce NLP company to Coveo, an enterprise search company, and he became the director of AI. He led machine learning teams there all the way to IPO. He's an adjunct, fe- adjunct professor of machine learning at NYU and is now the founder of Bauplan, focusing on enabling teams, in my opinion, to build state-of-the-art data pipelines at both reasonable and large scale. Hopefully that's okay. And from this conversation, I really hope that each of you learns more about recommender systems building data pipelines and taking models to production. If you're an investor or a data leader, that you really gain a better understanding of what it takes to get really good ROI from all of your machine learning pursuits. Jacopo, welcome. Thanks so much for having me and uh, thanks so much for considering me an expert. Yeah, uh, so uh... <laughs> I'm putting hardcore labels on you, so no pressure. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. It's like, I, mean, I think I'm lowering the bar for everybody else that comes after me. So, you know, so, so <laughs> after me, you know, you know, can really, everybody else can really shine in the podcast. So. Great, great. I like that. I like that. All right. What is, what is most exciting to you about all this large language model progress that's happening today? Uh, so there are a few things. One, let's say on the, on the excitement side, um, I've done NLP for quite a, a significant amount of time. I always say that I'm not an expert in I, I can, like I'm not an expert in anything. That like I'm mediocre at everything. Uh, but if there's one thing that I probably li- slightly less than mediocre, that will be that will be language. Uh, as I have a lifelong interest in in studying that, and 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 our first first company um, that we sold to Kobe was an NLP company at the heart. So as an NLP person, um, I find this new revolution incredible and. Uh, a lot of the things that I wouldn't thought possible in 20 years, if you ask me five years ago when I was building Tuzo, are now not just possible, but they're like now, you know, Twitter demos. Like now it's so easy to build something that five years ago I thought it was impossible that even people that used to be in blockchain up until three months ago can actually do that in an afternoon, which is uh, incredible. Um, so that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, on the, let's say, skeptic, old grumpy person boomer inside me, um, I, I, I'm also kind of on the other side, I'm a bit disappointed that, you know, LLMs are sucking a bit out the entire air of the machine learning, information retrieval, 
and LP ecosystem, because of course they're super exciting and possibly paradigm changing. No question about that. But there's still a lot of things that move the business needle. Actually, we can actually say that all the things that actually move the business needle still up to today, uh, October 2023, are not LMs. Are all the things that we used to, to do up until, you know, that we used to be cool up until three months ago or six months ago. And they're still the one that actually, you know, provide real production value to companies. And so my somewhat like less than hype take is LMs are super cool, but let's not forget about all the rest of the ML and data um, kind of like um, landscape because they're still where today the vast majority of the value is. And by the way, the lesson we learned in data and ML before LLMs are still going to be valuable for LLMs, not that we're going to throw everything away. Uh, so be good at fundamentals is still important. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, and just jumping into the new bandwagon without any, you know, say, critical sense is not going to produce any actually meaningful result. What's one example of that first step that you've seen coming into LLMs that this cautious approach that you're saying that's combining a lot of what we did before and a lot of what we hope to do in the future. What's one example of that you've seen um, being done well so far? Uh, so the uh, biggest impact that LLMs have on my life right now as a consumer, as a normal person, are by far the coding um, use cases, which I think are exceedingly well-crafted. I use CodePilot a lot, for example, just to mention that. And I think it's well-crafted for different reasons, not just because it's a cool model, but because the way in which it's actually implemented, if you go behind the, behind the scene, there's a tons of like nice UX attention, nice software craft on how that actually work, which makes for an experience that is, in the end, delightful. At the end of the day, all good technology is good because it's invisible. If I didn't know anything about machine learning at NLP, Honestly, I wouldn't really care. You know, I just have something that works and I think it's, it's, it's like very, very well, very, very well made. Smart Compose in my Gmail account is another good example of things that I use every day that are like, you know, powered by language models. And all of these examples are like non-intrusive, fairly easy to understand, great UX. Uh, you know, they improve over time, like nothing to complain about those. Dave, OpenAI did a really good job of convincing everybody that they have a really good model versus having a really good system. Because all yeah. of the the actual output, how it's formatted, figuring out, I'm sure they have a ton of NER, name entity recognition for those that are listening, um, that's going on behind the scenes to actually guide prompts to different things. And it, it's very interesting that the experience is so clean, but that also leads us to believe that an LLM, like these new LLMs, will automatically give us that clean of an experience. But I think, I mean, again, is the, the, the coming from recommender system information retrieval, right? The idea that that a clean recommend, the rec real recommender system, the YouTube recommender system, is one model that you feed input and gets output, and that's what actually gets rendered on the page, is a, you know, is a fascinating but obviously very, very misleading idea of how system actually work. The model has its own importance, but is machine learning system in reality, not machine learning models. So your models are good for papers and research and maybe, maybe for that. But in reality, machine learning systems is the, is the right level of analysis. Even the best model in the planet without a perfect machine learning system and pipeline and data is not going to perform, you know, like, you know, at, at its best. And on the other side, a decent but not exceptional model, if in a well-crafted experience and kind of pipelines, can actually provide a ton of value, like way more than you know people would actually suspect. Yes. And so the whole LLM thing started with a huge model. It, it did start with some open source ones. I think until consumers really started taking to it, everybody else didn't start to take to it. Now everybody's taking to it. It seems like there's a big one. And now there's lots of smaller ones coming out, Mistral, Llamas, things like that. Um, what's your view on how these will maybe get either combined or coalesced in in systems in the future i think i think we're gonna we're gonna go through the usual phase of like a uh, large general model that you can apply to different use cases and then smaller ones that are more fine-tuned and that are kind of like built for specific things um where the usual trade-offs applies right so uh a large model like even before llms like take a model like clip like general multi-model models right and you know they understand 
quite well quite a lot of things. But then if you want to understand a specific aspect of reality, you are almost always going to be better off by fine-tuning or whatever domain adaptation you want to do. That's just the nature of statistical learning, at least as we, as we, know, we understand it today. Um, an example like, of things that we did with my team back at Coveo, which is now one of the most popular open source clip model around, which is Fashion Clip. Yes. So like millions of downloads every month, which is surprising also, by the way, to ourselves. Um, but what we did was like, Clip is great, but it sort of gets fashion. What if we make a version of Clip that is really, really good at fashion? Still pretty good in general, but specifically, we want to teach him fashion jargon and fashion semantics. Um, and that's, you know, and then you can easily prove that on fashion things, this adaptation is performing better than the out of the off the shelf one. If you take the same concept to LLM, I have no problem or no, like, there's no, there's nothing that prevents me from thinking that this will happen as training this model will become easier. Pipelines and code will become more open source, commoditized, understood by a larger set of people. People will start adapting and fine tuning these models to their use cases, probably outperforming the general model, at least it's in current generation. And then, you know, maybe we're going to do GDP5 or whatever. And then, you know, that would be better than some fine tuned models. And then the cycle is going to come again. So new architecture, new fine tuning, new open source. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, just how this will, 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 will I think, will, will unfold, at least for the, let's say, short-term future. Yep. You, you and I were typically, well, not typically, you and I were technically competitors when you were at Coveo. So I actually worked for a competing company called LucyWorks. This is how I know um, probably a little too much about you because I was doing a ton of research and keeping a very close eye on what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And you guys were doing really cool stuff. Back then at Coveo, publishing a lot of research, doing great things in, in information retrieval and recommender systems. And I, I wanted your opinion. It seems like everyone is in search now. Everyone is doing, <laughs> before it was a very small, nobody really talked about search. Now search is like everything. What's your, what's your thoughts there? I mean, to be honest, uh, LLMs are probably the first time that something that's really, really new, potentially, hmm comes to information retrieval in decades, right? Information retrieval, you know, for, 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 for those who are not super familiar with the inner workings of how search work, search works, like normal search works with a variation of a vector space model team since the 70s, right? So the idea is that when you search for something, there's a vector representation of your query, there's a vector representation of your targets, like products in an e-commerce or documents in, a, uh, in an enterprise search use cases, and then there's some notions of distance between the query and the documents, and the closer these are in the vector space, the more relevant they are. This surprisingly simple idea can be implemented in a million different ways. For example, you can have simple vectors or embeddings if you want to be fancy, like you know, with, with deep learning. But the general kind of mechanics of all of this is kind of like the same. LLMs introduce a, a really new kind of like you know a really new knob that you can turn in search systems. And I'm, I, for once, having worked in search a long time look forward to see native LLM company. Like, how does a search system, again, not a search model, but how does a search system that is being thought of as LLM from the ground up will actually look like? And how does it solve problems that the vector space model could never really solve? So that's, I think, a very interesting area of research, um, so to speak. And, you know, challenges are not, you know, there are a lot of challenges there, right? Um, and I think, maybe contrarian hypothesis, that the rag thing that everybody's using now is once again highlighting that the hard part is not the LLM. The rag, the, the hard part in rag is actually the retrieval part. Yes. Um, and what one thing that I would love for people in the LLM on NLP community is to go back to the basics or ask people in the information retrieval community that has been kind of tackling this problem for like years and years. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Like we have, you know, decades of literature on how to search on indexes. And I think a new marriage between these two parts of the landscape, between these two communities, will produce, hopefully, a new iteration of, of, of search engines. Um, but that can only happen if people in information retrieval listen to LLM people, and people in LLM, in LLM words kind of go back and, and, you know, and ask information retrieval people, hey, what did you do all these years to solve this problem? I, you think they'll, talk, they'll actually talk to each other? 
I mean, that's my that's my hope. But you know, I'm a, I'm obviously an optimist. Otherwise, I wouldn't start a company. So oh. uh, that's my that's my hope, and that's uh, that's what I. And then in my in my very tiny world, that's what I've always tried to do is like you know bringing people from different backgrounds together and see if something that is more than the sum of the part, uh, you know, something greater than the sum of the part can actually can actually come out. Great. And it seems like you're you're known for recommender systems, but you've spent a lot of time in information retrieval, and to some degree, they're the same problem under the hood. Um, how do you see LLMs affecting recommender systems? I'm very personally very excited by by the prospect of it. So there's few areas there that I've seen people working on, even if I'm no means following the latest and greatest. Um, one. Uh, which I really like is in the back end of any information retrieval system, there's always relevance feedback. What does it mean? When you have a search system, you want to see where people click on after you serve them results to understand if you're in the right direction, right? And recommender system are the same, right? But like there are some use cases, for example, cold start when there's no much data about documents or, or queries that are very hard to solve with this kind of like supervised machine learning approach, right? And one thing that I'm really passionate about is using LLMs, like general ones, that have some sort of like very good common sense knowledge to produce fake but realistic relevant judgment into that sense. Mm-hmm. So imagine prompting GDP4 for, hey, this user has watched these four, four movies in the past. Like what, like what of these next five movies will actually you know, be, would actually be relevant for these users. And I have no other benchmark with me right now, but I would be very surprised if a version of this problem could not be actually solved by, by a large language model and would be immensely useful in a recommender system um, research as a way to produce more data that you can actually train your model on. So this is one sort of niche for, for practitioners, but I think it's a very exciting, exciting thing for me. On the other side, it will be, you know, Recommender system tends to be, let's say, one shot. You load a page on Amazon. There's a book. And then the recommender system says, hey, you may also want to look at this other book. Fantastic. But now let's make it interactive. So what if I can, can use a LLM and the recommender system together to say, can you give me something, I don't know, more funny? Or can you give me something from the same, like from, with the same title, but maybe less long? You know, maybe it's a textbook on databases, but I don't have time to read 600 pages, right? But it would be nice if instead of like clicking, I can say, hey, can you give me something like this? But, and then I express my preferences in English, like I would do with a librarian. And then the model will transform that and somehow propagate it to the recommendations. And then the, my new set of recommendations will be similar to the previous one, but moving in one direction. Um, so the UX and the interface between humans and machine, even a recommendation system, I think thanks to LLM could reach new height of like ergonomics, fun, uh, you know, pleasure, and even just accuracy, right? Yeah. Uh, because if I can specify this dimension dynamically using English, like an entirely different set of options like becomes now available for me as a user and for the merchant uh, as a supplier of recommendations. Yeah, that's a good it's a good point. I think I'm very aligned with that just because we've been modeling a user's preference based off of these very sparse interactions. I click on this, I click on that. I kind of know some stuff. I kind of know your browser. Like these very arbitrary signals versus them, someone saying, I don't like this. I like these things. I don't like this color. I kind of like the shade of color. I don't like this style. And there's so much that can be described about a human and natural language. And now to give a model, a true representation of a user to retrieve really great products. I think you will see, I'm excited to see the boon in, in e-commerce, especially um, just from people finding things that they love. And once we get the generative content and generative things, that'll be very cool where now I'm switching across a space of generated content. That'll be even more interesting too. Cool. Um, how would you describe a robust recommender system? I, I've heard you say, you know, robust recommender systems. What what does that mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the era that I've been passionate about in the last couple of years has been evaluation, uh, in particular, of course, recommender system, more general evaluation of system, but like recommender system in particular. We organized a KDD, uh, a very popular workshop this year it was called Everest, and we organized it uh, CIKM the year before a data challenge on these teams, 
um, uh, with a bunch of like folks from uh, NVIDIA, uh, Mozilla, Stanford, and other friends, right? Um, and the idea is that recommender system may make mistakes, and some of these mistakes are really, really, really bad. Like it doesn't matter how much your system is accurate in the aggregate, but unfortunately, even one mistake may tarnish the trust relationship, for example, between user recommender system. Let's make an example that so that everybody is on board. Like let's say you're recommending news stories, right? Um, and you know, if I recommend you a story that is not very fresh, but it's like from one week ago, sure, may not be the best recommendation of all time, but you know, it's hardly like a problem, right? Well, if I recommend you something like a, like, I don't know, like a COVID oaks article, right? And I'm the BBC. Now, you know, this may become actually a problem of public trust. You know, somebody may take a screenshot and post it on Twitter. You know, we, we all been, we all been there. Um, or, you know, even, even just more, more pragmatically, the person may even be misled in his belief and follow down a rabbit hole that may not be good. Or this person may say, oh, these recommendations are rubbish. I'll never look at them again. So in all these cases, a different level of severity, we as recommender system people are losing because we're not just making a mistake, we're making a very dumb mistake. So in my definition, a robust recommender system, as much as is possible to humanly foreseen this, would be a recommender system that, sure, it's right a lot of the time, but when it's not right, whatever that means, is reasonably wrong. Like when it's not right, it tries to avoid catastrophic outcome to some extent. And the only way in which we're going to approximate this ideal is by becoming better at testing and evaluating system, which is why our research and our open source work in Reclist and general evaluation of system, because if the only thing we test in system is accuracy, however defined, so you make 10 million predictions, you just measure how many times people click on them, that's really not going to save you from catastrophic failures. And honestly, it's kind of a very not nuanced and naive way of measuring complex realities, right? It's like if you if I tell you, can you tell me something about New York? It's like New York has eight million inhabitants. Sure, it's true. New York has actually eight million inhabitants, but it's not the only, you know, it's kind of a very not nuanced view of this very complex thing that is New York. Um and you know, machine learning recommender systems are kind of like complex animals in that sense. So they're better described by more than one number. Uh, <laughs> If you, I mean, the analogy was kind of terrible, but I'm just like making no, it up. Like but you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> what What's the hardest recommender? What's the hardest domain for recommender system? So is it? So I think even in within e-commerce, you know, you mentioned you did fashion clip. Why did the team decide to choose to build a fashion model versus something else? Yeah, so very good question. So uh, the, the fashion clip part was done as a combination of like opportunity, the opportunity to work with friends mm. at uh, Farfetch uh, in that particular case. So access to a data set that was very well curated and very, very large, um, uh, which was like fundamental to judge the domain adaptation of our model. Um, and of course, you know, market size, like fashion is one of the biggest industry when it comes to e-commerce, like, you know, a lot of like literally billions of dollars of fashion goods are now exchanged online. And of course, with the pandemics, uh, this thing even accelerated uh, compared to the previous to the previous trend. So that's that's definitely one one example. I don't think fashion are the hardest recommender recommendation you can make or search because of what I said before, because being wrong in fashion is rarely a catastrophic problem. Like if you're shopping for a pair of shoes and I give you terrible recommendation, I'm not saying that it's good. But honestly, you know, nobody, yeah, no, nobody is really worth <laughs> off rate, right? That much. Um, like news recommendation or any ranking problem that goes at like, you know, large scale. Imagine like uh, um, the ranking of a feed of information, for example, that tends to have way more impact. And so that tends to be harder in my definition because you need to be extra careful in what you do. Um, I think fashion and a lot of other e-commerce stuff, electronics, a lot of e-commerce stuff are incredible for machine learning people because of the combination of like data nuances and sort of like free mistake. As in mistakes are not really costly, yeah. which is the setup in which ML shines, right? You can make a ton of prediction. You can iterate fast. If you're wrong, nobody really dies, which is the opposite of like, I don't know, self-driving cars, for example, or whatever. What is the exact opposite of this? Like if you make one mistake, 
that's the end of it. Um, so yeah, so that's that's I think hopefully like a decent taxonomy. Do you see LLMs being used to generate like really huge fake product data sets, product and also interaction data sets? Um, just for folks to do research on and because I know you you guys had put out one of the biggest data sets. Um, yep. is that fashion clip as as a data set or that was a different one? Uh, so the biggest e-commerce data set on session based events was was the year before was the was the Sigayar data challenge okay. that we organized. And these are all uh, I mean they're like or mask and ash and anonymized, but these are all real interaction over real products. And it's the biggest e-commerce data set that that exists if you want to do real fine grain events. Uh, recommendation, for example, uh, it was a data challenge like a uh, one by the Nvidia Merlin team, which I say hi, ciao guys, um, in that. And the data set is still available for everybody for research purposes, like millions and millions of sessions into that. Um, I believe that LLMs would be fantastic in generating, uh, hey, this is like a fake but realistic product catalog. Um, you know, if you combine multimodality in a few years, right? Hey, this is, a, this is a fake fashion item that doesn't really exist, but this is also a picture like the one you would find on Farfetch of this fashion item, even if this fashion item and this model don't really exist. That would be, I think, fantastic to both experiment with new stuff and to cover, again, part of the distribution. They may not be super well represented in your original data set, and so you can use this model to do clever data augmentation. It's kind of like version 2.0. Remember we used to do computer vision and you take the picture of a dog and I use lightly tilt it to do that augmentation and make the model more robust. This is like version 2.0 of that. Now there's no freaking dog, like everything is synthetic, uh, but you can, you can hopefully tweak it even more um, and, and make the system more robust in some, some, some sense. Hmm. Um, what are some common mistakes you see people? I know you're not as much in the Rexy space anymore because you're building some, some good stuff. What, are, what were some mistakes that you saw people make when they were building some of these recommender system, uh, systems? In addition, how did that maybe change across different domains? Like an e-commerce team is trying to build one versus, let's say, someone's building document recommender internally or something else, or ranking feed, etc. I mean, I, I'm old enough and I've been enough in industry to see, you know, all possible mistakes and honestly to have done all possible mistakes myself at least once. So, so, so I feel very competent in the mistake, uh, in the mistake domain. Uh, I think the biggest mistake with recommender system, generally speaking, is the biggest mistake with any ML system that I've seen in my life, which is try to build a recommender system where you don't have a full feedback loop in place to somehow evaluate how well you're doing and to capture those data uh, in a very principled way, right? So when I, when I always talk to people that want to implement ML solution, I always say, before putting this online, you need to think of the entire life cycle of your data, which of course goes from data collection, data training, data pipeline, uh, how the model gets generated. But then super importantly, as importantly, every prediction the model does needs to be logged and needs to be joined together with whatever reaction your user do. So in the case of recommender system, every time you prepare a carousel of book for, for Amazon recommendation, you need to be very, very deterministically sure of which books the user saw and which, if any, the user clicked on. Because that combination, together with knowing which type of model, which version of the model, which version of the data that generates that, is the foundation of any improvement, is the foundation of any solid and robust understanding of what the system is doing. If you just push something out of the door, but you can't really follow the data, you know, from user to model, from model to user again, mm -hmm. and then again in the cycle, there's nothing you are going to even learn. And there's nothing you can really say with certainty on how the system behaves. So my suggestion with any ML system and recommender system, of course, is have a data feedback loop in place and make sure that works, you know, as well as it can before even put out a model. And then, of course... Once that is in place, start with the simplest model. Like the other mistake that everybody makes is always like doing a super complex model without even checking what, what the simple one is doing. But you can check what the simple one is doing if the data collection process is not in place. Once that is in place, it's going to be easy for you to improve on your model because you're going to collect data and analyze data and know where the model fails. And then you're going to be able to make judgments of what is the marginal value of model B versus model A? Maybe it's a bit better, but maybe it costs three times as much to train 
or maybe it's more finicky or maybe it's better in average, but it's really bad with niches or like with some specific group of users that I care about, right? Again, none of this is possible if you don't measure. And if you measure, then you can make experimentations with the peace of mind of knowing that, you know, worst case, you can always revert back to what you know is working. Something simple. Hmm. I, I guess my last question around sort of the Rexus thing is, how long do you typically see it takes for a new team to build out like a really, hmm, I would almost say deep, I find like deep learning recommender system pipelines are significantly more complex than a regular Rexis, a non-deep learning based one. Any any thoughts on that? As in how many people would you need in an ideal scenario to put that together? Sure, that maybe be, how many people okay. or like how complex can that really become? Both at reasonable and large scale. And we'll talk about reasonable scale. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that in 2017, when we started our first company, building information retrieval system, uh, deep learning or not from scratch, was still more of an art than a science. Uh, it was like framework were very mature. MLOps was not even a thing. You have to basically reinvent the wheel and discover all the quirks of serving endpoints by yourself. Uh, data solutions were not as good as today. Sure, Snowflake was already around, but it's not nearly as good as it is today or Databricks or whatever you want to, or Bauplan, <laughs> my own company. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, um, but now, I think the field is mature a lot, right? Right now, there's a lot of good uh, open source content on how you build machine learning and data pipelines, you know, including you know, some of the things that we did with, uh, with, for example, the people, the friends at Metaflow or the friends at NVIDIA. Um, and on the modeling side, it's become much, much easier to find frameworks that are the equivalent of psychic learn from progression. They do a similar job for a commander system. There's a bunch of very good frameworks that you can sort of plug and play into your pipeline and get a model up and running very, very quickly. So in the last five years, I feel that it feels to me advanced like 20 years conceptually, even if it was just like five years of like, of like, of like evolution. So right now I feel a relatively small team that know what it's doing, that knows, again, that understand the pieces of a pipeline, like data collection, training, and all of that, can realistically put together a decent system, you know, in, in not a lot of time. Um, and then, and then the more complex the domain, and of course, the bigger the data set, and you know, the faster you need to retrain, like all of these are knobs that you can turn to make this problem from relatively straightforward to almost impossible. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, any, any company somehow falls in this spectrum, right? So from smaller uh, teams in, in, in companies that are trying to do the first recommender system on the left of the spectrum to let's say Pinterest on the right, right? Like, Everybody sort of fall into in, in between, um, but but it's not an even distribution, right? Most company looks like the company on the left way more than companies look like Pinterest, right? Yep. And to be fair, people at Pinterest already figured it out years ago, so don't really need much help from the <laughs> from the community. Um, so yeah, so but I'm very optimistic. I'm very hopeful uh, because I went through this process myself when when building our infrastructure in 2017. And then I did at least two other versions after the acquisition of Tuzo while at Coveo. And of course, not just that Coveo was a larger and you know, more established company, but again, the field changed so much that my job was simplified tenfold between these three iterations just because of how awesome the, the community is and how awesome the tools that we now at our disposal are. Hmm. Talk to us about reasonable scale and how that whole paradigm came about. When, when you came out of it, I was personally very excited just because I think a lot of people were looking at super large scale and thinking, yeah, I could do this and this is how it's going to work. And I'm like, you don't have the data. So sorry, you can't get the results. Yeah. So I, I think, I think we started. So when we, when we started evangelizing this, we like a paper at Rex in 2021, the first like official appearance of the, of the reasonable scale tagline. Um, we noticed this, this thing. Um, uh, there's always two types of contents. And, and there used to be two types of contents online, right? One is 230,000 uh, tutorial on towards data science on how to put a logistic regression endpoint with fast API in production. <laughs> okay. So there's like, there's like literally 200,000 tutorials that they do this. And on the other side, there's like, you know, everything discussing Uber 
pipeline for feature engineering or Pinterest recommender system or whatever, okay? Which is like, you know, it's like if I, if I go and try to play tennis, I always have two modes. Either I look at Roger Federer training or, or you know, or basically I, I, I learn the rules and, you know, and I, just, and I just try to, you know, just try to play with the big balls like the kids do when they try to learn. Like there was nothing in between. And our, you know, our, our kind of philosophy was most companies are in neither of these extremes. Like most companies will never be Roger Federer. Like most tennis players will never be Roger Federer. And if they will, it's a good, it's an happy problem to have. They're going to figure it out how to train the moment in which they discover they have the talent and ambition of Roger Federer. That's good. But most people playing tennis are not even, you know, are a bit better than kids that are three years old. Like they actually can play tennis, right? And there was no material and nothing in, 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 that, in that kind of like middle range. And our argument is that most people fall into this because of the use cases. Again, most, most people have use cases that are much harder than logistic regression on, on fast API. Recommender system are a good example. But they're not as impossibly challenging as serving 2 billion users every day like Facebook. So the reasonable scale is sometimes this uh, relatively catchy phrase that identifies people working in this middle ground. Your job is hard, but it's reasonably hard. <laughs> you have enough data to be annoying. You're not working with CSV that you pass around. So you have like, you know, dozens of millions of, of rows for your recommender system, but not petabytes of data, right? You have latency and serving constraints, but not 2 billion user. Mm. And again, when you think about it, most teams work at this scale. By, by most team, I mean 90% of actual team doing ML work at this scale. Even a very, very large companies, um, I, I mentioned my friends at, um, at, at Metaflow and other bands, they started Metaflow and Netflix, right? Netflix goes forth is a planetary scale company as far as the recommendation system goes. But inside of Netflix, most of the data science use cases, the ones that are like internal to the company, not user facing, are actually at reasonable scale, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so tools like Meta, like you don't need a bespoke big tech infrastructure to do, I don't know, uh, analysis of which, which movies is going to be successful in the next three months. It's not, it's, not, it's not that type of work. And so even at big scale companies, there's going to be pockets, possibly the majority of pockets and use cases that are still at reasonable scale. And so our, our paper, but also the you don't need a bigger boat, um, like GitHub repo, which is like a reference implementation of a reasonable scale ML pipeline. Like all of that was part of this philosophy of like, like, you know, you're somewhere in between towards data science and Pinterest. And to get you started, this is what worked for us. Completely open source with data that you can plug in. And if it worked for us doing a recommender system for a fairly advanced company, chances are <laughs> it's going to be okay for you. At least it's a starting point. Then please go and change it. But that was kind of the, the mentality, if that makes any sense. No, that, that, that does make sense. And I think it, it's always a constant challenge, right, between do people fit into the big scale, but also at reasonable scale, how can you really take advantage of some of the state-of-the-art things that folks do at very large scale? Because that's it, it's always about solving those medium-scale problems. You left Cofeo. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about your acquisition and stuff coming up, but tell us more about what you're building at Bowplan. Yeah, so uh, Bowplan is, uh, I mean, the tagline right now, which is probably going to change every two weeks, but uh, <laughs> as uh, <laughs> uh, so it's a serverless data platform um, to handle complex workloads for data. Uh, in particular, what we're trying to, let's say, solve or what we're trying to accomplish is giving people an incredibly easy and incredibly fast developer experience with building data pipelines. That is, you have some data in an S3 bucket and you want to use SQL and Python, mix and match whatever you want to produce intermediate artifacts. You want to build a dashboard. Uh, you want to produce feature for your friends in the recommender system team that are going to use it. Uh, you may possibly even want to train a, you know, like a shallow model like a linear regression because of whatever you need to do. Um, and we want to give people the way of a way of building this that is no nonsense and is literally as simple as PP install Bowplan and everything else basically is taken care of from the platform perspective. What led you to go into this problem? Go into solving this yeah. problem? 
Yeah, everybody, as I, I always joke, like everybody always asks me uh, like wh- why I left NLP when everybody and everybody went to NLP. It was like, this seems like the hmm. moment in which you should do an NLP, right? And I always tell them that uh, is, you know, when 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 people from, from crypto comes into your space, it may be a good time to move out. Um, <laughs> but that's, of course, that's, of course, a non-serious answer. Uh, the serious answer is that after building a vertical ML company as our first company, uh, having seen more vertical ML application as part of like kind of leading Coveo um, AI and MLOps effort, uh, we kind of become more and more passionate about what happens before data science or modeling begin, which is how data, how the data management cycle, how data processing, how data pipelines are actually built. Uh, models get commoditized very quickly at the end of the day, um, in a good sense. Like, and I think this is a huge uh, um, value of like a thriving and like uh, open source ML community, right? So every good idea tends to become a nagging face plugin, a nagging face model, like less than a month or whatever. Yeah. Um, which is which is which is great, but also it means that the real value or differentiating value for any company at the end of the day is going to be the data. Honestly, it's always has been, and people working in ML, real people working in ML, always knew that. But data is really your competitive advantage, and that's not something you can commoditize because every data is different. Like your data lake is going to be different than mine. It is going to be different from you know somebody else's. And what you need is good tools to extract some value from this data lake investment that you made. And then feed them into whatever agging phase compatible uh, you know models you have. So we kind of became passionate of like helping people getting their data in shape more than let's build another ML company that applies fancy ML to to a domain, let's say e-commerce, um, and then and see how that goes. So that that's how it all started. Um, which is a weird uh, again, which is a weird uh, weird choice by if you look at it from the outside. But if you look at it from inside of like having gone to Different refactories on data pipelines at Tuzo, then at Coveo, and again, seeing all the ecosystem develop, it kind of makes more sense that, than, than it does at the, fir- at the first sight. Why is it a hard problem to build data pipelines? Well, because tooling is really fragmented and there's a lot of end off. There's a lot of like throwing things over the wall when you look at what actually thing people do in, in a real company. Like, uh, so there's like people with data engineering skills that they, they want to work with, uh, I don't know, orchestrator or, you know, Kubernetes or like, you know, very complex machinery, um, but they don't really iterate much on the data. They may or may not understand what the data purpose is at the end of the problem. Like, why are we building this? Sure, somebody told me on Jira that I need to prepare this table, but why do I really need this? And then there are folks that are closer to the business outcome and to the, to the modeling and to data and to reports. They may be very good at understanding why we need this data, may even know where this data is from originally, but they have a real lot of problem connecting all the dots and the infrastructure to do that. They don't know Kubernetes. They may even struggle with Docker. They want to, they want to have a fast and lean way to iterate and work on data. And so these two words are kind of like not really touching in, you know, in the middle, so to speak. And so the most common team topology right now is, hey, I wrote this script, which is terrible. Can you please, can you please build a pipeline out of this? And so one month later, we get the ROI of this effort. So now scratch that and take, you know, imagine a world when there's not this fragmentation of like a million tools and there's not this fragmentation of culture. Everybody wants to build a pipeline, you know, just do PP install Bauplan. You know your data, you know how SQL works, you know how Python works, that's, you just know that. And then Bauplan will basically run all these things for you without question asked, right? So you don't need to know Docker because we containerize things for you incredibly fast, like hundreds of milliseconds instead of minutes. You don't need to know Kubernetes because we run things in our runtime. So you don't need to know what a pod is. You don't need to size memory and all of that. You don't need to know how to move data between SQL and Python by manually going through S3 buckets because we optimize the data movement ourselves. And, and, you know, and all tons of other, you know, paper cuts that we remove. And then hopefully we'll lower the bar to, to work with data. Like we want everybody to be proficient with data. We don't want just data engineers to be slow and robust or other data people to be fast and sloppy. This is a false dichotomy, which has been forced upon us by, you know, maybe not super good culture, but also by bad tooling. And, you know, 
not sure how much we can do about the culture. We'll see about that. But we can definitely work on tooling. And that's kind of the, the bet we're taking with, with Bablon. Makes sense. And talk about data processing. How, how does that sort of play into... So I'm pulling, oftentimes, you're right, those tools are fragmented. I'm going to pull from this particular data source into this processing engine, back out to this serving infrastructure. How are you thinking about that data processing layer and optimizing that? So we really believe in the decoupling of storage and compute. Mm. And we really like the pitch of the data lake house that has been somehow popularized by um, folks like, for example, Databricks or Dremio in the last couple of years, right? So what is a data lake out? So a data lake is, you know, is, is your own object storage, let's say S3 or, or whatever buckets you want to, you want to put your, your data. Um, and by, by having a storage layer and different compute that can go next to your data, you're going to accomplish two things. A, you can get heterogeneous compute. As in, you can use different compute or even different language, like in the case of Bapland. Sometimes you can use SQL, sometimes you use Python. Doesn't really matter to us. You can just pick, you know, pick and choose whatever you want because the data and the compute are like independent. You can literally scale them and mix them and match them, whatever you want. So that's benefit number one. Benefit number two for large organization, the idea that now you're going to move all your data from all your buckets, from all your teams to one central repository, which is like, a central database where now everybody goes, is sort of irrealistic for different reasons. A, because this thing alone requires pipelines. Requires the pipelines, they move the data from buckets to the warehouse, mm. right? B, because all of this kind of like push further down the problem of organizing um, and, you know, and govern this data complexity. And three, of course, because of cost and security. Now there's one more piece of infrastructure. Your data may leave your VPC. So now you need to be very, very sure that you know, you're sending the right things in the right moment, and then you need to keep this in sync and so on. So there's additional complexity into this. So for us, the, the lake house vision, which is still a vision, meaning that I don't believe that any particular vendor or set of tools are really 100% realizing this vision, but it's a vision that we ourselves look forward to work with and to work for us to work towards because we believe it's an exciting combination of both words. Like, Heterogeneity of compute, the market is gigantic. There's room for all sorts of players that do all sorts of things better than other players. And on the other side, unification of storage. All the data of a company lives in an object storage that it gets paid once. There's no duplication and it's all safe and secure within the boundaries of enterprises. Hmm. That's an exciting, exciting mission, tall, tall order, but you've done it. You've rinsed and so I guess you're on the rinse and repeat program for for startups yeah like yeah it's like you know this is the so we call bow plan like uh like internally like a lake house in a cli uh, which which does, mm, doesn't mean much to clean. you know to people that are not really really into this but it's kind of our vision of like we really believe in the lake house but we don't believe in clunky combination of 72 tools to make it works or 72 you know somehow sub products of a larger product what if you can get all the things that I just said and the only thing you need to learn is like three commands on a CLI and everything else is done by the system? So that's at the vision we're like actually building towards. So. And ideally, who's the ideal target market? How big is that team that interfaces with your systems? Uh, our, our initial, let's say, um, um, traction and conversation that are like promising are in... Um, Series D to pre-IPO startup and, of course, mm. larger organization even, so, you know, Fortune 2000, um, that are, like, very familiar with the data lake architecture because that's what they invested already because of the complexity of organization. And on the other side, our system shines when you have, like, you know, five at least data people that work together. Okay. If it's, like, a small Series A startup with one person, the complexity you need to handle is all relative and, you know, and, and the, the sophistication of Baplan may be, may be an overkill. Um, but as you, as you scale and growth, and again, as you move away from this idea of like one monolithical data application, but having this lake and different compute layers for different teams, as you reach that point, which in our, you know, um, in our experience is, you know, CSD, a thousand people type of tech company type of things. And of course, traditional large enterprises in, in the Fortune 2000. Once you reach that point, the simplicity and the, and the, 
um, and the ergonomics that Poplon can provide can, you know, provide incredible air wipe and speed up on the productivity of your team just because of how simple it is to operate compared to basically any other combination of tools that you need to have, plus the simplification of having one tool instead of four, which I know it kind of sounds like a dumb value proposition, but it's kind of true. Like if I have one tool, why? If I can do everything with one tool, why would I go four times to procurement or four times to installation or four times to read manuals when I can just have one tool that kind of like you know, solves it all? You had mentioned on another podcast about the bill versus buy decision. So now um, I think you're even more in that situation about, okay, now you're, you're buying, but but seriously, what's the how should data leaders be thinking about this bill buy in this space? Uh, I mean, of course, I, I am biased uh, because you know I am you know I'm in selling you know data products. So, but I said this I said this before, even in the in my ML in my ML career, um, people should build only at two conditions. One you have for whatever is a spare engineering capacity that you can use and uh, you know and and your your system is so custom that it just makes sense for people to do that right so like if you're a facebook please go and build like you have operational constraint that nobody else has plus your entire tool chain is already custom yeah so you know if you want a good ergonomics you kind of need to build it yourself or the second one so the first one applies always to few tech companies on the planet and, and it's obvious why. The second one is, even if you may not be a tech-first company, e-commerce is a good example. You're a large e-commerce, but from a traditional retailer, let's say Home Depot, or you know, like this sort of thing. Like It's not Amazon, but it's still the, the e-commerce is so important and so, so, so crucial to your core that you should build in-house expertise for that, right? So if you're building recommender system of Home Depot, you should build it yourself. You should invest in that. You should try to build a team around you. You should try to build a culture around you. You should own this. But these are the only two cases in which you should build technology yourself. Everybody else, in all other use cases, you should buy from people like myself or possibly better than myself, if you're lucky, uh, that actually know what they're doing and they spend their time time understanding deeply how technology works. Your job as a data leader is understanding the functional pieces of a good data platform based on your use cases, your business constraint, your budget, and then fill those boxes with the tools that works the best or one tool that fills more multiple boxes, whatever that is. But that's your job. Your job is designing this architecture of boxes and then fill the boxes with open source providers, a bit of in-house, whatever, whatever you decide it to be. So that's to me... Is the, is, the, is the job of a leader. And to be fair, even ourselves in our previous life that we sort of understand what we're doing and we were building machine learning system as a product, we didn't build our entire MLOps tool chain, right? We actually reused a million of other tools that are out there because why not? My job at the end of the day is building good recommendation for my customer. It's not serving, it's not like, implementing a super low latency system. That's a means to an end. And up until a certain point, it makes sense for me to buy. And then, you know, again, and then you can decide. The, se- the last thing that I want to add on this point is what I always say, which I think is true, but underrated. If you start with buying, let's say you have a new, ish- new initiative. You want to add the recommender system to your platform. If you buy first, and after three months, you realize that everybody loves the freaking recommender system, you can always go back, and invest now that the ROI has been proven and build a team and build it yourself. If you do the opposite, it's going to take you two years to assemble a team, assemble the competence, ship the recommended system production, and you don't even know if that produces any value at all. Mm. So buying allows you to somehow postpone you know, engineering costs, engineering cycles, meetings, management, and all of that to where you know that this new feature actually creates value. That's what I said. Like, if this feature is so crucial to your business that you already know it creates value, the Home Depot example, again, you don't need to go through this cycle. But in many, many, many cases, I felt, I think people building data tools or ML tools when they don't even know exactly how big that will be for their company, 
And if you buy, you can just buy your way into knowing if this is going to move the needle. And if it does, by all means, build it yourself if you decided to do. But the opposite is way less efficient. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I like that you call out meetings. And well, there's salary and then there's headcount and then there's health insurance <laughs> and then there's managing. And so in, in order for you to go test something, you need to bring in all this human capital, manage them, and you still have to go buy software and pay for software to go build software. Uh, so that, that's an interesting, that, that's, a, that's a cool point. How are you feeling about building a new startup? I mean, you know, you, you, you know, what, what did they say? Like, you know, fool me, fool me once, uh, uh, you know, shame on, shame on you, uh, fool me twice, uh, shame on me. So like, this is the second one. So, you know, it's not that, you know, we didn't really know what we got ourselves into it. Um, so I was actually, uh, I mean, I, I think our, our ride and journey at Coveo was very successful. Um, not, not just as a team, but for the company itself, we joined when the company was growth stage, we left after the IPO. The company more the triple in size in in three years, um, and you know, so it was like it was like a great ride and a great learning experience, and hopefully, um, you know, also we did provide some extra capabilities to the company that you know may not have happened without without us, which I think is a fair is a fair assessment. So that was great, but it was time to to go back and do zero to one. At the end of the day, myself, but you know, almost everybody in the team is deeply in his root in his core. A zero to one person. So the person that really likes to figure out, uh, like how a product would work in the first place, how a vision would work in the first place, how to get the first customers, how to prove that your vision can scale. Um, there is a very different skill set and a very different mindset than joining a company is very mature and you're just going to do a tiny things on top, which is what is marginally make the company marginally better, which is what is required from you at that point, mm-hmm. right? Again, at Coveo, we didn't have to handle an entire stack because, of course, the company is complex. There's people that are much better than us in different parts of the stack. So we could focus on what was our, what do we do marginally better than anybody else, right? For example, pushing the envelope of the product, doing open source, uh, collaborating with universities, like all of that, all of that was obviously, but that's a tiny thing of what, in, in the great scheme of what the company does. And uh, building a company is going back to the other extreme, like, Nothing is there. There's no, there's no time for fancy stuff. There's no time for measuring improvement. The only improvement we care about are like, you know, step functions. Um, and, uh, but that's, that's what we like to do. And, uh, and I think it's been the Bauplan journey so far has been very rewarding. Uh, very tiring, of course. Like I should sleep probably a bit more now. I'm not that young anymore. Um, but, you know, that's again, it's not that I didn't know it before. So, so you don't get to play tennis as much anymore because you are a really, I, I think you had a match against uh, Rafael Nadal on UB <laughs> once. You know? <laughs> I yeah, I, I'm really bad at tennis. I constantly try to, I constantly try to become a bit better. Um, um, but uh, but I find myself not having you know the the time that I desire uh, to do that. Maybe after Bauplan become becomes public, yes. I will have I will have I will have a bit more time. I will have a bit more time to devote to my tennis skills. Uh, right now, I try to keep it once a week with my teacher just to not lose the few things that I learned in the past few years. So just to keep my level constant, but I don't see me improving like significantly anytime soon. I think it's, it's easier for Nadal to learn Python and challenge me on Python <laughs> than for me to actually challenge Nadal on tennis. I don't know, maybe he actually knows it already. So he's already ahead of me. In that someone, should reach, someone should tweet to him about that. Like, hey, do you know Python? <laughs> um, so one of, the, one of the things I want to do with this podcast is to, is to help investors understand more about how machine learning companies are built, how really good machine learning companies are built. What what thoughts do you have for investors, especially and I mean, what I feel is a very frothy environment for machine learning startups? I don't like to say AI, by the way, which, which is kind of weird too. I don't know how you feel about that. But uh, yeah, what, what thoughts do you have for, for VCs, evaluating companies, investing in companies? So first, I don't envy you because, you know, the, 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 the signal to noise ratio is already is high in normal times. And in the last six months in, in the ML community, I feel, especially in the ML as LLMs, has been like 10x. And one of the reasons why it's 10x is because of what I mentioned before. is like, com- like technology has progressed so much that it's very easy even for people that are not really ML people to somehow build a captivating demo 
but all the value, of course, is not in the demo, is in the is in the chat GPT or whatever, whatever API they're using. But if you're not very careful, if you're not a very technical investor or technical audience, it's kind of hard for people to draw a line of like, hey, this is what you put in in the demo, and this is what was already there thanks to OpenAI. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not an easy, it's not an easy, an easy job right now. Um, what I usually recommend to so this is my contrarian thesis about early stage startup. Um, it's impossible to predict, uh, you know, the future, especially the future of a startup, and that's and that's a platitude. So the only thing you can do, you can post rationalize investment as much as you want, but the only thing you can really do is pick good people. So my thesis is that early stage funds that are better on average are better because of deal flow, not better because they really pick better ideas or pick winners with you know more consistently than others. They just talk to better people in the first place. Um, and my, 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 my belief is that great companies are built by great people. Sometimes great people fail at building companies, even great ones or even bad mm. ones, because that's the nature of the business. But it's very hard that a great company has not been built by great people. So if you are very good at spotting great people, whatever that means, uh, not just on paper, not just like, hey, I have a PhD from whatever, but like, hey, I'm a really resilient person. Hey, I really know this domain better than anybody else. I really, you know, I know how to hustle and I'm not going to die, you know, and I'm going to die trying building this in a great company. There's a lot of things that makes for a great founder. But if you're good at spotting those, I feel as an investor, you're 10 times better than if you're just an investor that knows tech or, I don't know, healthcare, but doesn't really understand people. So I know it's a it's a you know somewhat like a disappointing answer because there's no there's no recipe for solving this problem now. But that's what I really believe. I really if I was if I will ever become an investor in my life, maybe as a retirement occupation, <laughs> it may, may may suit may suit my retirement days. Um, that's what I want to index on. I want to index on great people mm-hmm. and then leave them build whatever whatever thinks is best. Because at the early stage, there's even no re- no way to to understand if what they're doing makes any sense, right? Um, I mean, I don't know if what I'm building actually makes sense. <laughs> how, can an, how can an investor know better than I do <laughs> about mm. the problem that I'm trying to solve? Like that would be a bit presumptuous, right? But maybe an investor can know that I'm the type of person that's not going to sleep, he's not going to play tennis until until he really figure it out. Or again, if it's impossible to figure it out, he's still going to gonna die trying, so to speak. Why, why are you like that? And what led you to form your first company? So I always that's a, that's a good question. I I the answer is like I don't know. Like I don't know. Like I have a misplaced I have a misplaced <laughs> sense of duty, and I have like an incredibly misplaced uh, um, uh, you know sense of like work ethics, uh, which maybe comes from my from my parents. Is one of the is mm-hmm. one of the things that I probably have to to discuss with my therapist uh, um, or LM therapist uh, now now people yeah, are doing yeah, that yeah. as well. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, that's I don't know, but like I always wanted. To build something of my own, mm. uh, it just for life reasons. You know, you first, you know, you do a PhD, and it's never the time. And then you start working. I come from the other side of the world, so the entrepreneurial spirit that is so great, and in the United States, and in particular in Silicon Valley, um, is very different. Like there's entrepreneurial spirit where I come from, but is but the type of companies, the type of things you build are very, very different for reasons. And so it took me a while to find a good environment and ecosystem where my idea of like, I want to do something on my own actually was matched by an ecosystem that was exciting. It was um, inviting me to do that. It was like, you know, there was like rewarding this risk attitude and it was somehow matching my ambition. And so once I, once I built my first company, I actually thought, well, I should have started before this. So I should have built, you know, I, I've, you know, like if I knew this was, it was so much fun, so rewarding, I, I, I actually would never have been an employee in the first place. Um, so yeah. And so, and, and that's, and that's kind of like, I think it's true to these days. And I'm super happy to be an employee of companies that I respect and they're doing something that I, my vision can be aligned to for some amount of time. Like, you know, case of Coveo is a, is a good example. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel that entrepreneurs at some point always goes into this cycle of like, you know, I can work with somebody else on, on making this vision together come true because, you know, it's going to be a bigger vision that we're going to realize. But at some point, I still want to go back to have my own vision and then build my own company and all of that. And I think it's just a natural way of like 
um, that's the cycle. That's the deals. flywheel, I guess, right? Like you build, sell, exactly, exactly. join, build, sell, join, build, sell, join. And and I think and I also think that founders makes for exceptional employees, right? Mm-hmm. Like every time I read the, like a like a like a like a CV of people that try to build a company, successful or not, for me it's always like a gigantic plus because it indicates you know ability to hustle, sense of ownership, ability to see you not as a cogs in a machine, but to really take an end to end view of whatever task I'm gonna get get to you because you understand that what companies are about. Companies are about end to end, never about that specific thing, but it's always about specific things next to specific things next to specific things. And I think that's a true hallmark of a good founders is the ability to see it all. Makes maybe I'm not the best one at any of the specific things, and I'm certainly maybe the worst in my company of many of the specific things. But but I, I like to believe that I understand the entire thing uh, fairly well, and so I can I can ask people that are better than me at, at things to contribute and be the best version of themselves and be much better than I would ever be and then help them somehow thrive in this in this uh, organization. How how did you find out your first startup idea? Did you did you have an idea and you just did it or you it iterated and It's it's a weird it's you know it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a weird but also on the other side the most boring most boring story ever. So uh, Tuzo was born of a like weekend project with uh, with um, with Shiro which is um a co-founder of Bapland as well, um, because we we have a long lifelong interest in language from different perspective through our studies, PhD, and research. And remember, this is like 2016, so it's like like again before before even birth, like not before the lens, like a very different NLP, 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 and information retrieval landscape. And we thought there was a way to build a better algorithm for information retrieval based on what we know on our humans process language. Mm-hmm. So our idea was like, hey. We have this prototype that basically takes human language and do some magic with it and, and produce better search results. So how, what can we do with this? And then, you know, talking with, you know, with other founders and, 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 you know, uh, onboarding our, our third founder, Mattia, um, it was like, well, e-commerce is a, you know, search in e-commerce has two, two characteristics. It kind of sucks. So we can make it better with this technology and B, it's relatively easy to measure. Meaning that your performance is tied to a business objective, which is how much people buy. Um, and so it should be relatively easy. If you prove that your search is better, people should be easy to convince that they should adopt this. Yes. So that was the two premises of our first company. And they, they were, one was true, the other one was false, but we didn't know at the time. So, so at the time I was like, yeah, let's do this. Let's jump into this. And so that's what we did. Okay, great. And how big was your team that got acquired? Uh, six people at the time of the acquisition. Six people, and you worked on it for how long? Definitely, uh, three three years and eight nine months. I don't remember. Just slightly less than four years. Um, <laughs> slightly less than four years. Six people. Yeah. And how did did Coveo just find you? Did they just call you and be like, "Yo, let's let's do this"? Did you go to them? <laughs> we we met we met Coveo at a at a cool event in um, in uh, in in Canada. Um, um, organized by a um, few Canadian companies and Canadian University. Remember, this is the moment where deep learning started to become 2019. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. the moment was like, everybody gets excited to this. Canada was and is still partly a leading figure, like a leading country in all the deep learning revolution. In particular, you know, in that case with Joshua Benjo um, in, in Montreal. And, and Coveo was like, a, like, a, like the biggest AI player in the ecosystem. And so we met the CEO, so we did two, at that event, and we started kind of like exchanging notes. Kovea was doing search, but not really commerce, but they really wanted to go into e-commerce as the next step of the expansion mm-hmm. of the of the of the company. And we were doing just e-commerce. And so we started discussing. And then you know the idea was like, why don't we join forces of like if we can sell some e-commerce contract together, you know, we can use the Kovea platform, which is much more evolved and much more mature, of course. And then we can use Tuzo technology for specific things, in particular the f- famous query understanding logic that I mentioned, the thing that actually started Tuzo, which is this idea that you can understand queries like 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 humans do to some extent. Yes. Um, and that was the, the beginning of our discussion. And then, you know, one thing led to another. I think our our prototype in POC was being was very appealing to the company. Our our customer base was also even even if not super big, but was really let's say attached to the product of Tuzo. Our customer really loved it. Yes. Um, and they were producing like quite a lot of um, value, but in terms of business for them, 
but in terms of data for us. Tuzo was collecting an outstanding amount of data considering how big the company was. Mm-hmm. Um, and so at some point, it was a natural discussion of like, well, scratch the partnership. Why don't you guys just join us and do that? And so uh, we, you know, as entrepreneurs, there's always like an opportunity cost. At that point, we could have gone out and raised around a Series A uh, for the company. And we had other, you know, discussion that were similar in nature to the one we had at Coveo. But at the point, Coveo was the one that was more aligned to what we wanted to do, which is a search company. Coveo was actually a search company. And then the other side is that Coveo would have actually used our entire, you know, we're just buying, you know, few smart people or like relative smart people. Um, but Coveo was really interested in the company that we built. So the product, the way to, to develop stuff, the, you know, the, the mentality of that. So it was a better cultural fit than other options that we had at the time. And so we decided to, to join a company. And again, and we stayed happily for, for almost four years and saw the company grow. So you guys did, doing you guys did really good work, to be honest. I, I watched you all and I was like, shit, should I go to GoFeo? I, I had thoughts about joining and stuff like that. Um, what advice do you have for founders? You're doing this a second time. Actually, scratch that. What mistakes did you make in the first one that you hope not to make in this one? Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Here. So you have to ask me. You have to ask me in, in six months. So one one mistake that we that I think we did, um, and uh, we are not doing this time. Doesn't mean that we're not going to make sort of the same mistake, but in a different different perspective. But the mistake we're not doing is picking a market that is not humongous. Uh, hmm. This is like a. This is like one of the things that are like uh, in its simplicity that everybody tells in Silicon Valley the first time. But then very, very few people live and breathe this, right? Um, and uh, building in a gigantic market, in a market when there's proven possibility of becoming a generational company, it's a, it's a fantastic adds up compared to building in a market that as big as it is, it doesn't have that much room for expansion, right? Mm. Um, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter how smart you are. There's nothing you can do against a market that push against you or that is not growing, you know, as fast as you think it is. On the other side, you may not be even that good, but if the market is humongous, even just by chance, you're going to randomly at least have a good way to start your company. So that's a mistake that we, we, we swore to ourselves to never do that again. And so when picking data infrastructure as a market, among the reason that I, that, that, you know, on top of the reason that I mentioned before, this was a key aspect of like, we know that if there's one place when generational companies are built is data infrastructure. Mm-hmm. There's literally five of them. It's like, you know, there's like every 10 years, there's a new generational data company, like Teradata, Cloudera, Informatica, Snowflake, uh, Databricks. Nice. All of these companies are still gigantic companies making billions of dollars of revenues up to these days. And they all coexist in this market because mm-hmm. the market is so humongous that there's room for, you know, five public companies that are like generational companies. Um, in search, if you want to compare my previous experience, it's not the same, right? It's like a bunch of public companies, but not as big as these ones. Yes. And then there's a plethora of like smaller players, but it's not nearly enough the same size. So that I think is one thing that I, that I would recommend to founders. Um, pick a good market to start with, especially if it's your first company. Hmm. That's, a, that's a good observation. And I, I do think you're in, a, you're in a good space. It's a hard space. And it's a that's aspect. where differentiation comes from. So I'm, I'm excited for you because I think you've proven that you can get some shit done. And I know you guys are quite committed. So I'm very excited. Yeah, like I I, 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 I think there's like, so the, the big market in the end can coexist with the niches. Like, you know, if you read the, you know, Peter Thiel type of, type of book mm-hmm, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't mean that if your market is gigantic, you're going to go after the market immediately. But you know, you know, may, you may have like a tiny slice of this market that really works well for for the use cases. For us, it's like SQL plus Python data pipelines at reasonable scale. This is not the entirety of the data market; it's a small part of it. But but you know that a the market is so big that even a small part of it is actually fairly big. So we'll sustain the company for a few rounds at least. And b when you move out of this to the adjacent portion of this market in this larger universe you know that the possibility of expansion are almost limitless. So you can still coexist the uh, kind of like start small 
kind of thing, like, you know, know well a small set of user kind of suggestion, which is definitely rings true. But you need to combine that with when the company grows, you need to grow into a place when there's enough room, enough oxygen for you to breathe to really become a public company. If the market is so small, after the first niche, you're not going to have just anywhere else to expand to any meaningful, any meaningful size. But you're also going to ride the wave of small becoming medium. So you're going, that market in itself will also, by the time you get to a certain stage in the next couple of years, a lot more small companies will become media more, yep. come into this cloud transformation type thing. Wow. Cool. Okay. So you have a PhD. I, I'm, I'm going to ask for a little more of your time. So you have a PhD. Why the hell did you do that? Why, why did you do it? Of, uh, I mean, at the time it seems like a natural continuation of, of like my life. I, mm. I like, uh, so I've always been up until university. I've always been like a very lazy student, like, 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 game, yeah, like very incredibly lazy students, like, you know, copying Gomorrah's type of students <laughs> and, you know, not really read anything, uh, before the day, you know, the day before the it's exam like type myself. of student. Yeah. Uh, um, I always like to, like, I always like to read. I like, uh, I, I always read and I still read like an autogenous know, amount of stuff and I'm a very curious person by nature. So I will almost read or be interested in anything that is like remotely kind of like puzzling or interesting into that. My, my education has been incredibly broad. Like I'm, I'm like, you know, from, 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 from completely different, completely different fields meshed together. And I like it to be the way I'm not necessarily recommending it for people. To people, but but I like it as a as a kind of like a like a like a good mirror of myself. So at that point, doing a PhD was like an, an, a chance to stay closer to the type of people that I like to be around. So people that value some of the same things that I value. It was a chance for me to travel a bit, see other countries. Like you know, I spent part of my PhD at MIT, so mm -hmm. you know, kind of like forge new bonds, meet new people, understanding a bit a new culture, which became in years my new culture. Like you know, now I'm like you know almost as American as I'm Italian, so to speak, of like half and half, however you want to, you want to cut it. Um, and it was, you know, at the end of the day, three well-invested years of like learning stuff that are completely useless to my daily job right now, <laughs> but it still opened my mind and, and was like a, like a way to, you know, um, exchange opinions and stuff with people that I still respect up to these days. Even if our life now diverged so much that we don't have much in common in our day to day, but we can still grab a beer together and I still love to hear what my PhD supervisor, for example, is researching on, even if I can now barely read one of the paper because I've been out of that for so long that it's so hard for me to do that. Uh, so all in all, uh, rec recommended experience, like, you know, uh, totally, you know, five out of five, totally would do that again. I would ask, I would tell people, I don't know what was your experience, Mark, but I would tell people that maybe the single one factor of making that a recommended experience or not will be your supervisor. Mm -hmm. So if you find a supervisor that is very good, you go along well and you trust each other, whatever, uh, it's very hard for a PhD not to pay off in whatever meaning of pay off you, you, want, to, you want to use. If, of course, you have a supervisor that, you know, that hates you or you hate him or hate her and uh, your daily life is miserable, he may be like a freaking long and like, you know, terribly painful part of your life. Yes. But if you get the right supervisor, definitely recommend to a PhD. You never know what the future will bring. And it give you valuable skill and friendship that, at least in my case, are lasting literally a lifetime, at least up until now. Well, I don't know if your experience was similar. Skill and friendship. I, I, I really like the friendship component. I didn't necessarily think about mm -hmm. it. I had a lot of good lab mates had a lot of good times i i did a lot of cool i used to play basketball with my advisor lift weights with my advisor so it was a very very interesting bonding experience growing over that time um that's why i'm, I'm 100 aligned and that's like the number one thing if you have a shitty advisor just don't waste your time go do something else um okay so you read a lot all right uh, so before i ask you questions about books what is your career <laughs> optimization function with regards to like, you know, is it satisfaction, finances? It seems independence is a big thing for you. Yeah, I mean, I yes, like compared to the normal, you know, career trajectory of most people, I mostly did all the possible wrong moves that you could do to maximize <laughs> yeah. your, your career value. Uh, so I, I did pick, you know, going back in the day, like when I started in university, I did pick like, you know, um, logic, uh, because I, I read this book called Good Asher and Back when I was a kid because I'm so old that, you know, that, I, that AI used to be no monotonic logic when I was growing up. And so I decided I wanted to study that. It's like, you know, a terrible idea from from career perspective. I should have studied something more useful. 
um, then continue on a, on a PhD on doing even still incredibly useless stuff. Um, and then when everybody, you know, was starting getting real money in data science or ML, quit all of that to basically live with no salary for years to build my own company. Mm. Uh, and now when everybody would, you know, gladly probably pay quite a significant amount of money to do AI and NLP, quit that and say, no, no, I want to be a poor founder again. And I want to build data infrastructure. I want to learn something. I want to learn how a computer works um, because I never did before. So I, have, I, I made all the possible choices to basically minimize the financial impact of, of, of my career. Uh, and I, st- I mean, I, I still managed to, to somehow survive up until these days. But again, I wouldn't recommend if financial incentives are um, what you listeners are looking for. Don't really copy what I did. Um, like curiosity and challenges are for me a big part of life. Mm-hmm. Like I get bored very quickly. It's always been like that since I was a kid. So, uh, so I, I need to somehow keep my, myself and my mind going from one place to the other very fast because because I get annoyed um, by repetition, like like doing the same things all over again or solving, again, solving a tiny 1% better something that I really consider solved is not what gets me going. What gets me going is this open landscape, you know, the, the far west that needs to be conquered and you, and you, can, you can chart your own path into, into that valley. You can, you can decide where to go, where to stop and what to do. So that would be my, that would be my probably the things that I like implicitly optimize the most um and then of course being surrounded by by nice and 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 intelligent people like one thing that i'm most proud about my current company but also the previous our previous experience at coveo and the coveo labs initiative is the ability to bring together group of people that are both incredibly accomplished in their own right way more than i am um and they're also fun and nice and there are people we can generally exchange opinions about ml but also about life about books uh together about vacation we can you know we can we can go to restaurants and all of that and i think cultivating this community small community but around uh you know myself my interests and all my friends has been like a huge factor in the last you know five six years for me and i'm very proud of what what that brought about and all the connections and the serendipity um, that has been born out of this kind of like conscious effort of keeping myself in a social network that I can be really proud of. Um, and I can say, hey, I'm really proud of the people back in Bauplan. Mm-hmm. I'm really proud of the people that I work with. I'm really proud of the people that I go to lunch. We have this thing called ML Lunch in New York, which is basically a bunch of friends in ML, completely random, <laughs> a completely random cadence. We just meet in one place and we just we just catch up. And I'm really proud of every body freaking sitting next to me that day and you know and spending two hours together and i'm really proud of calling all of them my friends that's beautiful and very honest and i appreciate you i think calling that out i've interviewed a lot of people and you know a lot of it is around career you're climbing the ladder so and so and so i'm glad to see you're doing counter things i'm always taking notes Mm -hmm. from everyone that i meet um for those that so you come from italy so you came to the u.s and I think one of the things I also wanted to highlight is just you know, people from their own home countries doing great things. So I think you're representing uh, very well for, for the Italian people. And what advice do you have for folks getting into open source? You are an incredible open source contributor. You've done a lot. I think you've opened doors for many people. Um, what's, what's your piece of advice there for folks to get into it and why should they? Uh, I mean, the piece of advice is the the one you know that they always give to any anything in life is you know I was like, I don't remember the the exact phrasing, but it's like you know a, a journey of a, of a thousand miles starts with mm. starts with a small step, uh, a journey of thousands of GitHub stars starts with one commit. <laughs> so do the freaking commit, open your freaking laptop, do the freaking commit. Uh, if you if you're new to this, maybe start with a project that you like and you feel vested uh, in. And try to maybe do a bit PR, like a small PR, a tiny contribution. So mm-hmm. you get your, you know, you get your feet wet into the code bases. You can get feedback when you do a PR. You can start knowing people and so on. You know, it really depends on your skill. Like if you're really a very senior person, you know exactly what to do. Please do it yourself, but exercise common sense as usual. Um, but generally speaking, I think it doesn't matter how good a framework or an open source project is. There's always room to improve it, right? Uh, like, um, even not consider the thing that I did open source with my team, but the thing that we did with other things, like 
like the metaphor framework that we that we've been we've been we've been discussing like we collaborate with them to build the card feature so now there's an official feature of the entire framework that born out of a paper we wrote together a collaboration together uh, that came out from one of the prototypes that my that me and my team built right and that was like you know they didn't ask for it it wasn't an issue for it but i was like hey i'm using metaphor and i would really love to do this so why instead of asking for people to do it why don't I do it myself and then and then somehow contributed back and that kind of like spread it like in that case like you know like a new friendship a yes. new contribution and even more stuff together so just do it find something that you that you feel passionate about and and kind of contribute to it if you really have an idea yourself of course you can build something from scratch like we did a few times before um but maybe if this is the first time you do open source start with something that is already established and kind of learn the ropes and then go and, and build like a, like an open source project yourself. So that would be, would be my, my suggestion. Why do it? Because open source is one of the best things of this field. Um, um, you know, there's like, I understand there's some controversial stuff in the last literally three months about open source. Them. We're not going to go into that. Mm-hmm. But generally speaking, open source is the reason why ML or software progresses as is one of the reasons, maybe the main one. Well, ML open, data science progresses at the speed and which it actually progresses. And the culture of sharing that many people in this community holds dear, maybe because many people have a PhD, many people think and knows that research is a social endeavor, it's never an individual one and all of that. Like all of this kind of like good cultural thing, open source sits somehow in, in, in the middle of all these good intentions. And up until now, without going into, into, into recent controversy, but like up until now, open source has been a tremendous force for good for, for people, both for expert people, maybe Absolutely. like myself, they, they can use open source to that, but especially for beginners, because open source keep lowering the bar of what good tooling and good ML stuff is, making, you know, the, the, the leveling the playing field, so to speak, also for folks that didn't have the, chances or the opportunity to to go to a phd program or to go to a formal education in this so open source is great uh, open science is even better so open data set are even better than open source mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like folks folks in ml release your code but also please release new data set because without data there's nothing that we can really check or discuss about it uh, but generally speaking the openness of the community when i talk to my friends outside of software like my friends in pharma, in chemistry, in consulting, this whole idea that we share things free, like freely. Just like freaky you know, to them, We right? invest in fashion clip and then we put it online and everybody can use it. They can literally build the company out of it and they don't have to pay a dime for it. This whole idea is completely bonkers to basically most of humanity, but I think it's a fantastic idea. Hmm. Beautiful. Uh, tell me what you think of this idea really quickly. It might have already been done. I really want to open a journal for failed papers. Shit, that just didn't work. I tried this and it didn't work. Here's exactly why it didn't work. Don't do it. Because I feel like that people was, just repeat shit over and over. That, that's a very good idea. I think there was a workshop at EMNLP or ACL. I can, I can check. But there was a workshop at an NLP conference that it was like, yeah, shit that should have worked, meaning that it was. It made sense that this thing that you tried this thing, but it turns out that it was a there was a terrible idea. I think this is fantastic, and we need more negative results. Uh, genetically speaking, I don't think. I mean, of all the good things that I just said about the ML research community, there's also a lot of bad things, mm-hmm. and I don't think the community itself is in a particular good place, especially in recent times. There's too many papers. Reviews are like very bad. Mm. Our standard for scientific. Uh, discovery and scientific reproducibility is going down visibly by the minute. Um, so there's also, I would say, probably at some point, some reckoning mm. that we as applied research and research need to do. Uh, because right now it seems more of like a rat race of like, who's, who's going to post on archive the next Big slightly more paper, yeah. better fine tuning, yes, fine tuning model, whatever. And then uh, it's, it's, it's even hard to understand, you know, like, is it really better? I don't think we don't even have like a good understanding of, especially with this new generative stuff, like a very, very good understanding of like, what does it mean to be better? Um, so yeah, so that, there's, there's some work to do for us as a community. Um, but I think promoting the sharing of negative result is a fantastic and worthwhile endeavor uh, because telling you what didn't work is almost as good 
in some cases, actually better than tell you what worked because I'm still going to save you time. Yeah. The best way to learn is on other people's mistake mm-hmm. because you don't have to incur all the cost because somebody else already did, already did it. Yeah, uh, and again, and it's great. It's great as a community <laughs> that we that we can go together, get together with this level of transparency and, and kind of do that. Cool. Yeah, I feel like a lot of PhD students waste their lives because, you know, you do all this work, shit, that thing didn't work. And then you try to pivot. Uh, so I just wanted to, I've always had that idea in my head. So my last three questions, um, what three books do you recommend folks read? Because you, you're an avid reader. Um, so for like AI book, like, like, uh, like a man book? Any books, like just for you, like, you as you as Jacopo, the so, expert tennis I mean, player. I mean, I so I I so like I I will pick something that I that I that I read um, that I read like relatively recently. So I put different. Let, let's pick different different sure. uh, domain of different domain of of um, of the world. So one book that I want to cite again because it really changed my life. Maybe for the worse. I don't know. The counterfactual is very hard to <laughs> very hard to evaluate. But it's the book by Douglas of Tatter that I mentioned before. It's called Gödel Schönenbach. It's a fantastic book. It was it won the Pulitzer Prize. How do you spell uh, it? It's like a uh, of Stutter, H O F S T A D. Yeah, something like that. Um, but yes, like it's yeah. So it's 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 a book about AI that is probably all wrong by today's standards. <laughs> um, maybe maybe, but but that's not the point. Uh, the point is that like a fantastic it's a fantastic book um, about you know Gödel's theorem, so about logic. And about what logic has to teach us about how computer works, and about studying how computer works will teach us something about our own mind. Hmm. It's like a very hmm. kind of like uh, kind of like very broad view of of the field as it was in late seventies. I think it's from seventy seven, the original version, of like something like that. And again, very little of the current AI thinking will be found in that book. But the book is a spectacular intellectual tour de force. An attempt to to bring together very different things in a coherent view, uh, and just a pleasure to read. So that book really changed my life, uh, and I cannot recommend it, um, you know, uh, more like I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, on novels, well, I don't know. So I, I'm Italian. I was discussing what, what one of our investor. I, I find out later, but one of our angel investor is a really really huge fan of Calvino. Which is a very famous Italian novelist from last century, and we and we and we and sort of random because I actually happen to know like my my high school uh, thesis at the end of high school that in Italy you have to do was actually about this was about logic and about this particular writer. So it was like incredibly serendipitous that one of the investors in my new company was like, "Oh my God, do you know this Italian writer?" I'm like, "Yo, bro, yeah, I actually know him very well." Um, so uh, so I would suggest Invisible Cities from Calvino as a novel. Which I think is his best novel, and I think is a fantastic novel uh, for people that want to they want to they want to read it. Uh, and then finally, uh, like a non non fiction book um, from a completely different different area, um, but I think it would be it's very good. It's called Freakonomics. Yeah. Um, and it's a book by Stephen Levitt, um, which is an economist, um, and it's a it's a fantastic book because it's a book that teaches you. Like how great research questions, how great causal questions are done, and how you can use numerical methods to answer those questions. But mostly, is a book about a person that is really good at observing human behavior, and that is really good at charting out incentives and how they work together. Doesn't matter if you don't like money, doesn't matter if you don't like finance, but human behavior is deeply maybe not fully, but deeply, deeply regulated by incentives. Mm-hmm. And by understanding the incentives of people and how they move and how technology change it, how tools, how products modify them, is a very, very powerful lens to observe reality and to kind of make plans and decisions. And of all the books that teach you how to do that, this is the funniest, you know, easiest to read, more interesting. So, so the, the, I'm not suggesting this book as the last thought on the subject, but if you want to think about human behavior in a somehow principled way, mm-hmm. I think that's one of the funniest uh, reads you can get, and it will, 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 will teach you valuable, valuable stuff. Very cool. All right. What's one piece of advice you have for a high schooler, someone in college, and a professional? Uh, I mean, I, I, it's the same one for, for all sure, three. Cool, it's like cool. do, 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 some, do something that you like. like. Do something that you love. Like it's, it's impossible, like it's impossible to, 
I think it's impossible, especially at the rate of change of the world today, mm-hmm. to make too many, too many bets of like, hey, if I study this in high school, I'm going to get a, like a job for sure when I grow up or whatever. Interesting. And uh, I think that's probably false even at university. Now, now jobs change so quickly that it doesn't matter. Study something that, will, that makes you feel good. Study something that you love. Study something that you want to get deep into this. Then, you know, if it's something that is deep enough to entertain you for years, it's impossible that you cannot get something valuable out of it. Is it as a job or as transferable skill and so on? Like take my PhD. I study something that I want to, to study for the sake of it. And again, is there a job in cellular automata, whatever they are? Obviously not. There's not a job in cellular automata. But by studying that and going deep in such a, such a complex topic, I certainly learn something that then I can apply to you know, I don't know, building a data lake company, so to speak. Yes. So do something that is fun. I don't know what I'm going to do in five. I generally don't know when I'm going to go in five years. Like, it, would, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, if after we, we take Bauplan public, I go back and get another PhD. Like, it may th- <laughs> start in a, completely different, in a completely different topic. Like, it would be incredible. If, the more you know me, it would the not more surprise this thing me. will actually, <laughs> it actually will be completely unsurprising. Like, uh, or if I build a new company, my next company is going to be a company about, I don't know, genetics of pets like studying cats cats gene that's totally that's totally possible um so yeah so like you know the most interesting person that i people that i know don't know what they're gonna do when they're gonna grow up even if they're already sort of grown up like myself Mm -hmm. and honestly i don't want to ever know like uh, i i wish i can never know what i'm gonna do when i grow up even more because it means that i'm gonna continue reinventing myself and i think that's a huge part of like funny life is, is keep on reinventing yourself. Oh, that's a that beautiful makes perspective. Any sense. I didn't think of it like that. I'm like the complete opposite. I'm like, what's exactly <laughs> need to be done? Um, okay, here's a wrapid round. You're stuck on an island, okay? And you have a specialized chef that can only cook two meals. What are the two things you're going to eat? <laughs> so the first one is going to be pizza for sure. Really? Pizza is like my favorite <laughs> thing in the world. I, I love pizza. I know it's a, it's a cliche for Italians and the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> But but pizza, I, feel that I can eat pizza like three times a day, and I think that's that's really that's really that's really my thing. So that's one one thing that I really really like. For the second one, you know that I that I that I generally I I mean, for the second one, I would always say it depends. But I can give you two different choices depending on you know what's available on the island as as prime you know as as the ingredients, right? So one thing that I really really like, and I know it's terrible for me, but I really really like is like fried chicken. Oh, dude. I freaking love fried mm, chicken. Mm, uh, mm. Like good fried chicken is like amazing, and I could eat like literally buckets of it. Yes. And the other thing that I really really like is fish. So for example, I really like sushi mm. and sashimi. Mm. Like I really really like that. So depending how fancy the chef here, or like you know how how much fish there's in the in the in the waters of the of the island versus how many chicken we can we can we can somehow breed i would pick one of the two but first pizza and if it's only pizza i will still be happy i can eat pizza literally every every day every moment of my life very cool besides pizza what's one thing that brings you joy uh learning mm. learning like i really love learning stuff i really love learning stuff like one of the things that i that i that i really enjoy about this new company is like that I'm so ignorant in so many things. <laughs> I mean, don't don't tell don't tell my investors. But like, I'm so ignorant <laughs> in so many things that, it, that, it, that every day I learn something new, and uh, it's fantastic. Like six months ago, I didn't know X, and now I can talk to a professor, a university professor on X, and uh, and we kind of get along together. And uh, and that feeling of like you know being from being super dumb in a topic to being sort of okay. And then doing it again for all sorts of topics uh, is like really addictive to me. I really like learning new stuff. Oh, that's beautiful, man. All right, last one. What do you want people to remember about you? Like in this podcast or like when I'm going to die? When you're dead, when you're gone, you're out. I mean, I, I don't think I'm a person that people will remember will remember much <laughs> about. I don't think I'm, I'm that important. Uh, but, you know, he gave it all uh, mm. and he helped everybody could. I think are two things that hopefully define myself as like, you know, never, you know, again, and I don't know if Bauplan's going to be successful, but we're going to die trying to make it successful. And uh, I don't know how much I can be helpful to a high schooler, a uh, person at university or a professional. But if you write to me and you ask for help, as you know, compatible with normal life constraints, I would always try to, you know, to help you and to give back. Because when I was in time of need, when I was nobody, not that now I'm somebody, but I'm like, I'm less of a nobody than I was like five <laughs> years ago in, a, in, some, in whatever meaningful you know, sense. Somebody did take the time hmm. to help me out, right? You know, maybe not many people, yes. maybe less than what I would have hoped, 
but somebody did take the time to bet on myself. And now it's my time when I have a bit more stability, a bit more, you know, resources, wealth, time, and knowledge to give back to the next Jacopos, right? Yes. The one that comes with a random plane from a random country, you know, to, to Silicon Valley or to New York, whatever. And, and some will give them the favor that somebody did to me five years ago. And, uh, and I, I want people, very few people maybe, but I want somebody to remember that when, when the time comes. Sounds good. Well, I've completely enjoyed this episode. I, I laughed, I learned, I'm inspired. So, so thank you for sharing the time. Thanks very much for having me, Mark. All right, later. Mm-hmm.